you know, why I had a thought today that I was just pondering. Actually, I had it last night, middle of the night, but I got over it and got back to sleep. That doesn't always happen. Uh, but I had a thought and um, about... <clears throat> We often, look, we, we, I mean, all of us, we often take the things of God, the truths of God, the teaching of God, the principles of God, and we add them to our lives. And, and, and on the surface, you may say, okay, what's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing wrong with adding them to our lives as long as at the same time that we are subtracting other things out of our lives. Like faulty thinking. You know, as, as, as you know, any, anytime you read the Bible, anytime you hear a sermon preached, hear, hear, hear a Bible study, we should be looking to subtract, empty ourselves of bad thinking as we take on good thinking. Maybe, maybe that just, I mean, I know you get it. It's not over your head, but maybe you're like, okay, that's, that's fine. But I got hung up on this thought and just thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. That, that we take the things of God and we try to add them to as, as if we're trying to improve the old nature. When we need to be, it needs to be a constant in and out. In with the good out with the bad, in with the new, out with the old, in with good principle, out with faulty principle. And, and that's for all of us. But I wonder, and, and, and because of this, I wonder if we, if we take new things in, but we're not, we're not allowing the new to push out the old. We're, we're, and, and in some cases, we're not willing to let go of the old. And the new just, I, sometimes I wonder if it even has room to come in because we're so holding on to the old nature. And I'm not talking about sin like wickedness, you know, vile. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about faulty thinking. And are we, is it our goal? When you came tonight, was it your goal to say, I hope to learn something that will cause me to say, I receive this and I expel that? You know, why are we here? Because if that's not why we're here, we're really here for the wrong reasons. Now we're here to pray, and I, you know I know all of that. I, I should, shouldn't say it. that's not a blanket statement. We're here to pray for each other tonight. We're here to fellowship, although there's not a lot of that going on. Not like it used to. Not right now. It's just different. Um, but look, but but the main thing in our lives is right here. That is the main thing. It, it should be. That should be the main thing in our lives. That right there and this right here and God in us teaching us this. And whenever we put ourselves under the teaching of the Holy Spirit, whether it be uh, you know, in, on, on, a, on a weekend, in a service, Wednesday nights, or during the week as you're, as you're having devotions yourself in the Word of God or you're watching somebody else, the whole goal of that is not just to walk away saying, that was really neat. That was really good. The whole goal is to, is, to, is to make it part of you. And to do that, often we're going to have to get rid of other stuff. There's other stuff that's going to clutter and fight for our attention and, for, and to dominate our thinking in a certain area. So anyway, just a thought that I had. Uh, last night and today. We're going to pick back up where we were. I think, I didn't mark last week. Uh, I think I know where we left off. Uh, if I didn't, then, uh, then uh, we're just going to go over it quickly. But we will get through tonight. And um, we're looking at the words here in uh, James chapter 1. 
And verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it should be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like, the, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So 5 through 8 is, is, the, is the section of Scripture we're working with here. Remember, uh, 2, 3, and 4, we talked about that God, God gives us a vision of temptation and says, look, the purpose is to work, bring about patience in your life that you don't freak out, you don't flip out, you don't become so fearful that, that, you, that, you, know, that you fall to the temptation. God says, it's a good thing in your life. I want you to see it for what it is and count it. Count it all joy is what he said. Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, many different types of temptations. And, and they work They work in our hearts and lives and they're brought and God allows us to go through them and, and he tests us. He's testing our response to the temptation to teach us. Now the next part here that we've been in last week and now this week is wisdom. As we go through the, through the temptation, it is the wisdom of God that's going to get us through. It's the patience that's going to keep us on track in the midst of temptation, in the midst of testing and trial and hardship. It's the, it's the, it's the patience that will say, no, stay on target. Stay on target. Stay on the path. Because God is teaching us to bail out and to yield and to bail out is to, is to make the testing null and void. It's a failure in your life. Patience says, no, just relax, be calm, because God's in charge, and we're on this path. Stay with it. God will get us through it. And, what, and then what will get you through it and actually a a enable us to manage, to manage the, uh, the, the try, the temptation, the trial, the testing is wisdom. How many times, how many times did you get into something dark and you just thought, oh, I just knew how long it was going to last? That'd be a good start. Or if I just, if I just fully understood this, I could manage it better. Well, wisdom will help us to understand it, to remain patient, trust God. And so here he goes from the, your, the view of temptation. Don't, don't, don't jump, you know, don't, don't jump ship. Stay on course, stay on target. And, and as you go through temptation, pray for wisdom. Pray as you go through testing and suffering, persecution, whatever, whatever it is that God's taking you through, pray for wisdom. Patiently pray for wisdom. So we talked about having a lack of it last week. We talked about what wisdom is. It's enlightenment. It's special insight. We talked about asking of God, which actually that word, that, that phrase, ask of God, means it, it, is, it, is, it is to demand assistance. It's to go to God and say, okay, I'm here. I need it. I need it. It's not to go up to God sheepishly. He says, come boldly to me, which he says in Hebrews 4, 16. Then he talks about giving it liberally. And this means to stretch out and give continually. This word liberally has three, has three meanings and they all come into play here. Number one, continually. It means that God's wisdom never runs out and his provisions know no bounds. He gives continually upon our request. If we have the wisdom of God, will, I mean, are we, aren't we more apt to choose the right way. God desires for us. He, he begs us to please ask me and, be, and, and, and demand that I give you my wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally. I got all of it you need and it never runs out, he says. It's continually, it's singly. It's singly. When we say singly, God is saying that I treat each and every request as a single issue and I focus upon each and every caller individually. God knows you personally. And he doesn't just say, I'm just going to throw a bunch of wisdom down into Clover Hill Baptist Church. It's not what he does. He says, I'm going to give wisdom to those that ask me of Clover Hill Baptist Church. And if my little granddaughter that's sitting right there so nicely and calmly 
If she were to pray and ask God for wisdom, do you know what he would do? He would give her wisdom. He loves and he takes delight in every single one of us. And it's, and it's, so it's a sing, it, he does, he answers this request continually. He, he answers it singly to you, specifically you. And then he, and it, and it naturally, the word liberally uh, also means uh, naturally. In other words, look, sometimes when we are, when, when, when God leads us to do good by somebody, sometimes we balk at it. Because we have a sinful nature. And then sometimes we, 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 we apologize to God and, go, and we go on and do the good thing for somebody else. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just say, I'm not doing it. And we justify that, you know, somehow it's not God leading us. It's, it's just a bad thought that we had. No, but with God, it's not that way. He, he, it is his nature. It is an attribute of God to do good to everybody. God does the best for everybody. Every time. Every time. You say, well, what about, what about when God comes down and he chastens somebody? Well, apparently that's the best thing for them right then. The Bible says that God chastens those whom he what? Loves. He disciplines those who... So even when he is chastening us to get us to get our attention, to turn us back around, that's the best thing that he could be doing for us. And God always does the very best thing for us in our lives. You've got to believe that. You've got to have that kind of faith. So, so it's continually... As he gives it liberally, it means continually, it means singly, as in individually, and it means naturally. Then the words upbraideth not. It means not to, it means to, uh, to taunt. So he, but, but he says upbraideth not. It means he doesn't taunt you. Have you ever done good by somebody and, and you're doing it out of just duty? And inside you're thinking, you don't deserve this. You don't deserve this whatsoever. I'm going to do it because God's told me to do it. Kind of like Jonah preaching to Nineveh. Did he want to go to Nineveh? No. He went to Nineveh because he went on a ship to flee from God and, the, and they threw, tossed him over. The whale swallowed him, took him to Nineveh, spit him out on a beach, and he ran to Nineveh and preached a revival. He didn't want to. God doesn't treat us like that. Uh, he upbraideth not. He doesn't taunt us. He doesn't uh, disparage us. He doesn't ridicule us. He doesn't get angry and frustrated when we ask. Do you know that everything in the Bible is that, that God commands us to do, it's really bringing us into his presence? Everything. It's trying to create a deeper relationship with you. Pray for your enemies, Right? Well, who are you praying to? You're going to God. Everything is designed to get us to look to Him for the strength to do it, for the power to do it, for the grace to do it. And so when we come to Him and we and look, and maybe we've made a mess out of our lives, and we go to God and say, okay, 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 I'm going to resort to the principle of how do you get wisdom? Well, you ask for it. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it should be given him. That's a promise, okay? Lord, I've messed a lot up. You sure have. But I am here. I need desperately, I desperately need you. I need your Holy Spirit. I need the wisdom that the Holy Spirit will give to me. I need it. I've got to have it. God is like, that's, that's all I've been trying to say. That's all I've been trying to do is get you to come and ask me. Get me involved. Live your life. Take me with you everywhere you go. God's not up there saying, you don't deserve it. You vile. You're one of my children, but you act like heathen half the time. He doesn't say that. No, when you come and, and, and you ask for wisdom, God's like, okay, now we're on track. He's not going to slap you off the tracks that you should be on. 
He upbraideth not. So don't, look, I don't care how big of a mess that you've made or, or how much maybe that you're doubting as you go through a tough time. Go to God. That's all he wants. Ask in faith, the next phrase says. Ask in faith means that we trust God, that we trust that God is trustworthy and we believe that he will honor his promises. Just because something is available does not mean that we have appropriated it. Is, is salvation a free gift? Yes. But if you, if you don't come into God's presence and receive it and ask for it and receive it, it does you no good. Just because it's available doesn't mean that you've laid claim to it. It's like salvation. It's, it's free. It's a gift. It's free. It's for every man. But every man does not come and receive it. So, it, so just because it's there does not mean it's yours. And the same with wisdom. God just wants you to ask. He just wants to talk to you. I was reading today in Exodus and talking about the altar of incense and how as they burned it and the smoke went up. It was a sweet smell to God. That is representation of our prayers. As we pray to God, God says, I smell it and I love it. I love it. So don't just say, oh, I just don't. And, and look, the temptation is to say this. The temptation is to say, now you know I need it. Why do I got to ask for everything? Why? Why do I got to ask for everything? And God says, because I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. It's not like God's up there, because I said so. <laughs> God says, no, I just I want to talk to you. I want you to depend on me. Ask in faith. Nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. The emphasis is, is on asking in faith and that we are not to doubt. It is senseless and empty to ask for something from God and then doubt whether he's going. Look, look, when I ask for things from God, I never doubt if he can ever, ever. Sometimes I may wonder if he will because I don't know that I'm asking according to his will. But we are supposed to ask nonetheless. Look, we pray for people every weekend here on a Wednesday night. Honestly, sincerely. And I believe that we pray in faith. I believe that we ask in faith. But we also know that sometimes he answers the prayer that we ask and sometimes he doesn't give us what we want because it's not the best thing. If we believe that God always does the best thing in every situation for every person in this world, then we will ask because he says ask. He commands us to ask. You ask not because you, ha you have not because you ask not. But he says there are going to be times when you ask for things that's not my will. But you still, but, but still come to me and let's talk about it. And if it's not my will, I will comfort you. I will give you the grace to handle what's going on. If, I, if, it, if you're like, but, but I want this person out. Maybe it's not yourself. I want this person out. I want this person healed. Uh, uh, you know, and God says, well, I'm not going to do that because that's not my will. I want this person to go through this. They need to go through this. And everything, everybody around them needs to watch them go through this. I'm trying to reveal myself to everybody around them, including that person. And it would be, it would be unwise. It would be, it would be, it, I would be a bad father if I gave you what you're asking for because I have a greater path. But, but because I can't give you what you're asking for, I will give you grace. To say, okay, I will say, just relax. I, the Spirit will comfort you and help you to relax. If you're yielded to the Spirit, the Spirit will comfort you and help you to relax and say, okay, I trust you. That's what it's all about. I trust you. Nothing wavering, nothing 
wavering. Uh, there was a person that came to this church since I've been here and um, in, in, didn't say the words, but in as much said to me, and I may have mentioned this last week, but uh, in as much said to me, basically I'm here because I just started a business and I want God to bless my business. And, and that is such a worldly view of God. It's like God's a genie, you know? And, and, and I may have told him, because I can be blunt sometimes, not unkind, but I think I said, that's not the way God works. He doesn't work that way. And you need to know that before you run off and God, you know, your business fails and then you point your finger back at God. You need to understand that it doesn't work that way. We often try to conform God to our will. And often our prayers are not according to his will because we always pray to get out of tough situations and to get people out of tough things. So often God says, I'm glad we're talking. Oh, I just love this. I love, I love seeing you come to me and it makes me feel, you know, uh, just, it's, it's, it's just a great relationship we have. But I can't give you what you want because it's not the best. And, uh, and so we have to, you know, and then uh, I'm being redundant. Then God gives us that grace. But now listen to this. I'm going to read for, from you from Genesis. And God said unto Abraham, as for uh, Sarai, Sarai, Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but call her name what? Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give thee, uh, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? He was 99 at the time. And shall Sarah, that is 90 years old, bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. That was, that was Abraham and Sarah's trying to help God out with his promise. Brought Ishmael into the world, which is the father of Arab nations, which is the one that does this to is with Israel, always has and always will. Because they tried to help God out. And what Abraham said was, can't you just bless what we've started? And God says, I don't work that way. I don't conform to your plan. I don't conform to your idea. None of it. I have a plan. I have a purpose. And my purposes will be accomplished. And he says, in spite of what you think, you're going to have a son, and his name's going to be Isaac. And he'll be the, 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 son, the, the child of promise, the son of promise. So, nothing wavering. Do not, look, we've got to be very careful not to set things up and give God a plan to bless. He doesn't need our plan. <laughs> he doesn't need our plan. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Saul the other day was, was listening to this guy on a computer, and he used to have fear God on his arm. This was a guy that used to be in a traditional church, left and went to the progressive church, and came back. A lot of that going on these days, and came back. Well, when he was all caught up in the progressive church, he had fear God from, from earlier days tattooed on his, on, his, uh, on his forearm. And the guy that he was, he went to a meeting and heard him speak and met him afterwards. And the guy says, what's that mean? Well, that means fear God. He said, why in the world would you want to serve a God that you fear? Now, this is progressive thinking. He shook this guy up so bad he had the tattoo removed. But the Bible clearly states the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That fear is not a quaking, shaking, running. That is an awe. That is A-W-E, to be in awe of God and say, man, why? Hey, and when Jesus said to the disciples, will you also go away? And Peter said, where are we going? You're the one that has the words of life. Great statement he made. And, and if we 
fear God, if we look at him like, man, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels, heaven and earth adore him. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. If that's our view, do we not, look, if that's our belief, do we not get up every day and say, all right, mighty God. That's what it means to be in awe of God. And that's the beginning of knowledge. That's the beginning of, of wisdom and instruction. Because the Bible says, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The word fear here means to be in awe of God. And when we are in awe of God, not very, hey, very little wavers in our lives. It just, uh, we, we don't, we don't. I believe God and I don't believe God. I believe God loves me. I think God hates me. You know, I believe the God it will help me. He's nowhere to be found. That's wavering. And God says, I, I, don't, I don't work with that. I can't, I can't bless that. I can't work with that. And if you do waver, when, when we look at the next phrase, he, he is like a wave of the sea. A wave of the sea. Doubting creates instability. When we doubt God, it creates instability in our own lives. What's a wave of the sea like? It's pushed to and fro according to the will of the wind. I know, I guess everybody didn't hear at one time or another has been to a beach. You can, you can see the waves come in, say, and they hit the beach coming from the right to the left on this morning. You get up the next day, it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> it's going from the left to the right. Why? It's the wind. The wave has no control over itself. It obeys the pleasure of the wind. And God says when, 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 you, when, you, uh, when you doubt, when you waver, you're like a wave wavering. You're like a wave. You're just pushed to and fro by your emotions, by the things of the world. And it goes on to say, I want to concentrate on the next word, anything there. Uh, let, let not this man think that he shall receive anything. Anything. It does not mean that God's not going to meet your necessities, give you what you need. It's not like God's going to walk away and say, forget you. You, you know, you're, you, you're wavering all over the place, and I don't have time for that, and I don't like that, and I'm just going to walk away, and you're not getting anything out of me. That's not what it means. God is, God is a good father. And he's still going to give you, I mean, he's not going to leave you destitute. But it does mean for these special prayer requests, God says you've got to believe. Jesus did not many miracles in Nazareth. Why? Because of their unbelief. His hometown. He went back to his hometown. And not many people really believed. And it was, and, and, and it was, it was a real marvel. Oh, and the Bible says he healed a few sick folk. He healed a few sick folk is what it said. Because they, they didn't believe. They didn't trust him. They didn't ask. And if they did ask, they wavered and said, ah, he's probably not going to do it anyway. He just couldn't do great things for them. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Double-minded means to have two souls, if you will. It means that this man has a grip on two hopes, one being the Lord and the other being the world. Aesop. You've heard of Aesop's fables, right? I don't hear about that much anymore. Not that that's good or bad either way, but the Aesop, the, 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 the writer of the famous Aesop's fables, tells a story of a bat that attempted to live in two worlds, that of a bird and that of a beast. If the bird world experienced success and, and, and could give him something that would help him, he claimed that he was a bird because he flew. And if the beast world, if, it, if, it, if something could, could help him and, and add to his life by, by claiming that he was a beast, then he said, no, 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 I'm not a bird, I'm a beast. After both the birds and the beast got tired of the bats jumping back and forth, they both disowned a bat. Upon this, the bat found itself confined to the, own, to the coming out in the darkness to fly at night alone. Now, Aesop and his fables are here to there. But 
It's being double-minded. Kind of a good illustration of being double-minded. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Right? That's one mind. The other mind is, he don't love me. I mean, it's the same thing. It's double-minded, wavering, back and forth, having two souls, if you will. One that seeks God, and one that gets his strength and energy and hope from the world. Yeah, try that on the, in this day and time. The world's crumbling around us. Government's absolutely batty. Crazy. I saw a doctor today. I didn't tell you that. Went to the doctor today, honey. Uh, Frankie Pugh. And, uh, and we were talking about this. We were just talking about how insane it is. There's no hope in it. The devil's really pulling the curtain back. And people are still going after it, lock, stock, and barrel. Double-minded, having two hopes. Luke eleven seventeen 17 says, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. Double-mindedness. It's just, it, you won't get things from God that way. Oh, he's not going to run off and leave you. But, but you're not going to get these special gifts that he has for you until you finally make your mind up. Till we finally make our minds up that we're going to serve him and believe in him and trust him. And, and, uh, and hey, and when we do doubt, what was it the guy said? Hey, uh, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. Sure, there are times. There are times when all of us kind of go, it, it's just human. You kind of, uh, and you just say, I mean, what, what's going on? At that time, your prayer should be to God, help thou mine unbelief. Help me when I doubt. I don't want to doubt. But it's natural to doubt. It's natural to fear. It's natural to be anxious. I don't want to do these things. It's natural to waver all around. I don't want to do it. When you feel yourself in that mode, go get to God and, and unload all that on Him. And say, I'm, I'm feeling a little weak today. Boy, I really, I really need you today. Unstable. A double-minded, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Um, it means one that can never settle down. It means one that can never settle down. It means a, a 50-year-old man, now this is just illustration, so if you know a 50-year-old man <laughs> that's like this, I'm not talking about them, I don't even know them. It's like a 50-year-old man that never gets married because he just never could pull the trigger. Never could settle down. Never could... And, and, and there are believers just like that, that they never can just settle down with God. They never can. And they never do. They just never settle in at His feet and settle down. They remain unstable their entire life. They're 60 years old, and they have not grown since they were six years old because they're double minded, because they're unstable. And they can't settle down. Look, and, and look, I, I'm not preaching like, I'm saying like I feel for that person to not find their place, to not be able to settle down with God in their place where God can hover over them. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Finding that place where, 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 where you're under the wing of the, the, the shadow of the Most High. Settle down. Trust Him. Not doubting, not wavering. Trusting Him. And we have a lot of people in a lot of churches that just can't settle down. They're holding on. Double-minded. Two souls, one that wants God and one that wants the world. And they go years and decades without ever making great decisions 
or, or meaningful decisions because they just don't. They just haven't settled down with God. That's what it means to be unstable. And I feel for that person. I feel for those people. So, all right, good. We got through that. It's 804. Give me 60 seconds. Verses 2 through 4. Deal with our view of temptation and the testing of our faith. And the great reward of the testing brings patience into our lives, which causes us to just stay on target. Causes us to settle down, stay on target in the patience of God. And then verses 5 through 8 teach us that the best way to go through temptation and testing is to surrender to God's wisdom. Ask for it, apply it, make it part of you. And then, and then temptations, they're not a breeze. But, but they do, but you're able to relax. You are able to relax. Now, doesn't mean you won't have a bad day. Doesn't mean you won't have a bad day. But your general, your general path in life will be right, right here where God wants you. Trusting Him. Loving Him. Getting into His presence. Asking of Him. Wisdom. Give me wisdom. Help me figure this out. Help me to manage this. Oh, I'll help you manage all of it. Piece of cake to me. I've already been there. I've already walked that path in front of you. I'm already at the end of the path waiting on you. All right, we'll begin next week with verse 9 and keep moving through, our, through the first chapter of James. Father, thank you for, uh, th thank you for the um, wisdom, yeah, the wisdom that we get from the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the teaching. Thank you for the Holy Spirit instructing us and, and, uh, and revealing that you're more than just some words on a piece of paper. There's great meaning to these words and there's great depth of truth that you're trying to get us to, uh, you're trying to teach us and help us as we learn these things to find the, uh, find the things in our mind and in our heart that would fight against the truth and help us to expel them by putting the truth at work in our lives, making it applicable in our lives, that we may glorify and honor you, and that we may have great, great meaning and great purpose of living down here till we see you one day. Protect our people. Now watch over them uh, throughout the end of this week. It's going to be dangerous out there the way it looks, and I pray you'll uh, watch over them. Uh, give us all uh, enough sense to stay in when it's just, when it's dangerous out and and, uh, and care and watch over our people, though. Keep them safe. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.